as a kid, I was really, I really wanted to discover things. I realized that we just did not bring enough food, and so we were, we were, we were running out of food, which didn't help with their morale. Doka, Doka. Those cameras had less, had 48 hours or less of being set up and having a chance to detect the owl. What is this? It's it. It's it's owl. <gasps> All right, so that, I mean, let, where do we start? How have you started working in New Guinea? What? So, like, talk to me about this. How did we get to you rediscovering this bird that hasn't been seen in 140 years? Where did it all start? What happened? Yeah, so I started graduate work in New Guinea in 2015. So I've been studying fairy wrens, which are common common backyard birds, in mostly in Australia, but there are some species in New Guinea. And so I teamed up with with some folks who had just started a project in New Guinea studying one of the species there. And that was my window into, into New Guinea as I had worked in Australia and I got this graduate opportunity to do more fairy run work. My advisor wanted me to continue doing fairy run work in Australia because that's a lot more of a, a sure thing. Um, it's an easier place to work than, than New Guinea for a lot of reasons. Um, and I already had had experience there and knew knew how to do the work there. Um, but I just wanted to have, uh, you know, some new adventures. And New Guinea, of course, is, you know, it's built up as the last frontier in a lot of ways, um, both for science and, and adventure. You know, there's, uh, it's such a, it's such a unique and incredible place. Um, so I just wanted to have some experiences in New Guinea. I really liked this fairy run I was working with. You know, I was really interested scientifically in in this bird. But if I'm being honest, the main thing was getting an opportunity to to spend extended time in New Guinea. So over the course of my PhD work there, I ended up spending, I went there four different times and each of those trips was three to five months. So wow. I spent wow. about a year and a half in, in total in the country. Um, and it, you know, it happened immediately in 2015, I got really invested in, in the place and the people. Um, so it just, it, and this happens, I think with a lot of people who get, get, uh, one of these rare opportunities to do research in New Guinea, it, it just gets in your blood really fast. And so already in 2015, I knew that this is, this is the place that I wanted to work for the rest of my life. And I started working with people who I wanted to work with for the rest of my life. And it just completely changed the course of, of my professional and, and personal existence, frankly. Okay. So what, so when when we move forward to uh, it's 2019 right um you went to look for this should we call it the owl, how what are we calling it owl woe or were we calling it the black knight pheasant pigeon yeah so it's actually well yeah we we we, we can do either we can kind of interchange so yeah owl owl woe is the the local name that we learned on this recent trip black knight pheasant pigeon of course being the the uh the english name uh but actually in 2019 i was there so let, let me try to to get you there in a, in a, in a non-convoluted fashion. So in 2015, my first field season, working with this fairy wren species, uh, my brother, who's a geologist, came to visit um, one of my field sites. And from, from that field site, I could see this, I could see Ferguson Island. And it's this really rugged mountainous island. My brother is really interested in mountains as a geologist. You know, he's interested in rocks and geothermal activity. Ferguson Island is known for geothermal activity. It's you know they have these incredible geysers and and prismatic pools and so i ended up taking my brother there on his on his brief visit and while we were there i was trying to see this bird of paradise that was endemic to ferguson island and, and neighboring normanby island so just endemic to two islands there and so i was paging through my field guide and pointing to that that species and asking people okay like, you know we're we're here to to see the see the rocks you know i wanted to to entertain my brother. Um, but of course, you know, as a, as a bird enthusiast, I really wanted to see this, this one bird of paradise. And as I was pointing at that one, they would point to another bird of paradise on, on that page that was not known from anywhere close to Ferguson Island, the, the blue bird of paradise. Hmm. And they would say, Oh, this, we have something just like this, but it's, um, the tail is different, but otherwise it looks pretty much the same. And we occasionally see it when we go like up to the highest mountains. And so I had enough people tell me that. And at that point I already, you know, that was my first field season, but I already had gotten the sense from working in a, a few villages that 
the local knowledge of birds tend to be really, really good. Yeah. And so I kind of got this stuck in my head that, you know, there, you know, there could be something, something left to be described on Ferguson Island. Maybe this bird they're telling me about, because we couldn't find it in the field guide. We couldn't think of anything that made sense. You know, maybe this is, um, a new species that, that we could come back and describe. So that's, that's what motivated me to come back in 2019, which is my last field season for my dissertation. Um, just did a two week trip to Ferguson Island. Let's go back to these areas and try to find the people who, you know, said that they were seeing this strange bird and maybe we make a plan to go up in the mountains with them and, and, and try to track it down. Uh, and it didn't exactly work out that way. I didn't find anyone who was really giving me the same information that I remembered from 2015. We still ended up going into the mountains, um, and doing a, you know, a proper expedition. It was the first expedition that I've, I've done like that, uh, up into the mountains of Ferguson to areas that hadn't been surveyed by ornithologists before that even local people hadn't been to before. Wow. And we saw some really, really excellent birds, including, you know, a bunch of new records for, for Ferguson Island, one new record for the whole archipelago. Um, so it was a productive trip, um, but we did not find anything new. Um, and I kind of learned on this trip that actually, I think the bird that they were telling me about was another very common bird of paradise that when you catch it in the right light, it has this iridescent sheen to its wings that make it look like the blue bird of paradise. But normally it looks like a, like a crow, you know, mm. it's just an all, all black bird. Yeah. Um, so on that trip, um, I brought along my field assistant at the time, Jason Gregg, um, who had brought along a new field guide that had the, the recent taxonomic split of the pheasant pigeons. So in my field guide, they were all just lumped into pheasant pigeon with local subspecies. So the one on Ferguson was a local subspecies. Um, in his field guide, now it's a, a separate species. And from what we were seeing in the field guide, there's basically nothing known about this bird. And so um, we started asking local people about, about that species. We found a couple of hunters we worked with who said they, they claim to be familiar with it. Um, and so that's just something we kind of tucked away. We knew that, you know, this is probably a priority species because it seemed like there was nothing known about it, but it wasn't until we returned to the U S that we realized that, wow, there is truly nothing known about this bird. It has not been seen for a really long time. Um, and, you know, eventually found that, yeah, the only thing that's been published on this is that there are two specimens collected in 1882. Since then there's been no formal documentation. Um, so it was, it was, Jason, who was, you know, then my field assistant, now my collaborator, who really um, was was on top of this and fortunately had the recent field guide where where they were split. Otherwise, otherwise, it's it's hard to say how, how things would have looked. Um, so we ended up writing a paper just reporting our, you know, the new records that we had for the island and included in there that, you know, we didn't come across the black knight pheasant pigeon, but some local people seem to be familiar with it. Um, you know, it's now this is at the time that was an endangered species. So we knew that, okay, this is, this is going to be a high priority to, to look for it. Um, so we included that in, that in the paper, even though we didn't see it, see it, um, or, you know, we weren't able to confirm any of the local reports. Um, after that paper was published, then it was uplisted actually to, um, critically endangered by IUCN and eventually, um, this is now, you know, years later, because we published it in 2020. And then in this year, in 2022, um, John Mittermeier at American Bird Conservancy, who's running the Lost um, Birds Project, he got, he had seen the paper and got in touch with us because the black knight pheasant pigeon is, you know, one of the highest priority species for them because it's been now, you know, 140 years. Um, it's critically endangered. And we're, Jason and I are the ones who have been to Ferguson Island and have already spoken with local people about this and had some leads as to, you know, who we might be able to team up with to, to find the the bird. So that's all how this all came together. So that's pretty mad. That's like, yeah, it's it's almost like a, a, a bit of chance. And then your expertise in this area is, is giving you this opportunity. Yeah, for sure. I think I think being, again, I think just being open to new adventures, because this is, I, I am trained as a as a physiologist and um, physiologist and, and like behavioral ecologist. So I do really I tend to do really um, intensive research on one species at, at a time, where you're really digging into like individual variation in these species within a population. So that's the kind of research that I normally do. Um, but because I've been doing work in New Guinea, where there's just so little that's been published on the birds there. 
Um, and again, the local knowledge is really good. So there's kind of this disconnect between local knowledge and what's being published um, in the scientific community. And so I started to kind of develop these these side products with the help of um, you know people people like Jason, um, who are more trained in uh, like basic ecology and conservation. Um, you know, it just was open to kind of a new research research adventure um, that was really just trying to trying to tap into to the local the incredible local knowledge in these areas and um, you know learning about species that we just there's there's not not enough um, that that we know about these species and so it's impossible to to develop conservation interventions until we actually um, have a better handle of of what species are occupying these areas and um, yeah so that that's that's kind of how this all happened. So that's how it's all started from 2015 over to 2019. So you knew there was something there. And then you've got in touch with uh, the Bird Conservancy of America um, for 2022. So then how does an expedition come about? What happens there? Like what, who, what, what's going on? Yeah. So really, you know, Jason and I just kind of started planning which villages we wanted to visit. So, and what kind of methods we wanted to use to look for this bird. So they were, this all came together a lot more last minute than what you would normally do for a, um, a trip like this, frankly, because it requires quite a lot of planning. So, you know, it's really hard to get in touch with, with people in New Guinea. And so I have people I've been working with in these areas, but it takes a long time to, to get in touch with them and let them know like, Hey, this is when we're, we're planning to arrive. And we want to work with you again. And we want to work with these other people who you can put us in touch with. And, um, yeah, so there was a lot of just there's a lot of time uh, trying trying to track down um, folks in New Guinea who you know are, were going to be essential to to making this a su successful trip. And then Jason and I spent a lot of time just kind of designing the methods for for looking for this species. And you know what we came to is that we wanted to interview local people, specifically local hunters who are spending you know most of their time in the bush um they're the ones who know the forest the best and know the species that are that are in these these forests that uh you know outsiders have, have not been to before that might be harboring these pheasant pigeons um because there have been other other ornithologists who have spent time on ferguson island and no one has come across a pheasant pigeon and they're really hard to see but the when they're vocalizing that that sound carries a considerable distance since so that's how most people end up um detecting the the some of the species that are on the mainland um i've heard one before on the mainland up on a ridge um that sounded like it was really really far away down in this like steep river canyon um so if you're if if they're calling you know it's it's pretty pretty easy to come across and so it's pretty telling that there have been some ornithologists who've gone to fort ferguson and had gone to areas that presumably should be harboring the species that never saw or heard them um so anyway we we knew that the the best way with a month to search for this species was just to to chat with as many local people as possible and instead of doing the thing that that i would normally do when i arrive to villages and i there's just certain birds that i want to see where i page in my field guide and point to them and ask if the bird is there um i think that's a you know pretty reliable way to try to see birds as a tourist but if you're trying to approach things more objectively with determining whether or not a species is is likely still around you don't want to really give away what you're what you're looking for because you know we're all sort of guilty i think of if someone says they want to go see something um we might talk ourselves into like oh yeah i, I know i know that i know that bird or i know that animal um i i can i can help you find that thing so um we came up with this method where we had 25 different bird cards uh, that we put down and have um, people just pick out the ones that they see in their area. And so if they pick out the pheasant pigeon, then then great. However, if they're picking out the pheasant pigeon, but then they're also picking out species that we've mixed in there that we know aren't on Ferguson Island, then we might think, well, okay, there's a chance they're seeing this bird that there's also a decent chance based on their the other birds that they've chosen that we know aren't there that they're confusing with something else so how uh, how, how many times did you do that did you did, did you ever get someone point at these different things that weren't there yeah oh yeah. okay so that is, i assume that makes it a lot harder then it makes it a lot harder but um that th this is what allowed us to kind of be efficient with 
our time in the bush because everything is is privately owned in New Guinea, all the land pretty much. Um, there's very rare cases where the government owns the land, but basically to access land as a tourist or as a researcher, you have to negotiate things with a whole bunch of landowners. And it, it takes a long time just to come to a good agreement that everyone is okay with and make sure that everyone is, you know, getting, getting the, um, a little bit of the money that, that you're bringing to these areas, you know, that there's guides and porters from each of the major families. And, um, that's the main thing is that, you know, we're hiring people from all of the, the different groups that, that can, own I just, the land. can I ask about that as well? So I know it's, yeah, it, it's yourself and uh, Jason who are yeah. leading this together. How yeah. how many people have you got for this sort of thing? Have like what's the sort of what's the squad size? What's what, is it big? Yeah, it was th this trip was unusually big. So we ended up with initially nine core team members, yeah. um, which included actually the the donor for this for this expedition. Um, so he was along and and he brought a. Uh, a friend along and then we had um john mittermeyer at american bird conservancy who's you know leading the lost species stuff um and so he was there and then it was jason and i and then we had um uh the head curator of the national museum in port moresby which is the capital of, of papua new guinea um and then we had doka who everyone everyone knows doka uh who i've been working with since 2015 you know he's both a a close friend and um and collaborator on these, all these projects like everything all the most difficult things i've done in new guinea it's a really difficult place to do research especially the kind of intensive like physiology and behavior research that i that i do N none of it would be possible without without doka he is just he's a, as incredible as he seems in that in that short video um so he he of course was along he's indispensable um serena is also indispensable i've been working with her since 2015 she's a logistics expert um, and is also really good with the birds. And then we had this guy, Ellie, along who helped us arrange the expedition in 2019, who's a local to Ferguson Island, um, who uh, was was the translator. So Ellie and I were doing, were leading the interview. So um, he, he and I were meeting with all these hunters and and running through all these questions. And so there are initially nine core team members. And then in each village that we would go to, if we got some good responses to these questions, um, and we wanted to go search in the forest ourselves, then, you know, we'd arrange with landowners and end up hiring, you know, two to four guides. And I think up to like 10 or 11 or 12 porters sometimes, because we have a lot of food that we're bringing into the bush. Yeah. Um, we, we also just want to make sure that we are, you know, spreading the, the, the benefit of our, um, the, the funding we're bringing to as many people as possible. Um, so that's, that's always a focal point. And so we always, hire more than you know probably we we absolutely need so it also frees us you know it's not just you know trying to do the, the right thing by the by the locals it's also part part of it is that you know free we can free up our our heavy bags so we can end up focusing on on the birds ourselves and um be more efficient with with our observation time so, um so i was gonna, yeah. i was gonna say it sounds very expensive um do you i'm not sure if you're at liberty to say but like what's the sort of ballpark figure for a month in new guinea and hiring people out and a team of nine what what sort of money are we talking there yeah i mean it's it's on this it's, it's actually the food isn't too expensive and you know daily daily rates for paying porters and guides really good um really good fares for for that aren't aren't you know super expensive we we were camping, so you're not really paying for lodging. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no hotels or anything. Um, if we stayed in a village, we would we would pay something to whoever owned the house that we'd put our hammocks under. Um, but it's reasonably, yeah. That's none of that is super expensive. What is expensive is taking the the boat out there, paying for the fuel, and charter chartering a boat. Um, so that's you know thousands of um well it ends up being you know in total for a trip like this you know thousands of dollars are just devoted to to transport yeah yeah well, um, i can imagine you got to get everyone there really haven't you it's uh that's almost yeah. the hardest bit because uh it's the one that hurts yeah. everyone's pockets um but so and, and with a lot of food with with, with a yeah. lot of i mean a lot of gear and a lot of food so it's heavy heavy weight and so you're burning through you're burning through a lot of a lot of fuel because there's there's no, you know, grocery stores on Ferguson Island, right? So you have to 
buy everything in advance and mm-hmm. pack it onto these boats. And we're, we're really way down. And then we had, you know, a lot of funding that was devoted to um, camera traps and automatic recording units. So we brought 20, 21 camera traps uh, and, and five automatic recording units because, and of course the camera traps are really what, what ended up doing doing the 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 really important uh detection work for us because we weren't able to detect the bird ourselves and so um, all that money was was well spent um we knew because this was an elusive species that we needed to to leave some some gear in camera traps and automatic recording units that was going to um boost our chances of detecting the species even if we couldn't detect it ourselves it's it, it sounds a bit mad it's obviously it's it's a it's a big thing isn't it like a month away in that sort of environment but like how how harsh is that environment because i know I, I read about like it was steep and quite hard to traverse through like in your experience obviously actually being there and doing it how hard was it yeah it's really hard <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard and and i you know one of my biggest hobbies over the years wrote for my whole really my whole life has been you know, like hiking and backpacking. I, I love, I love covering, covering a lot of miles and, you know, carrying heavy weight and uh, yeah, sleeping under the stars and, um, and it's specifically hiking in the mountains, you know, covering some, dealing with some significant elevation gain, but this is just, it, this is just on a different scale because it's one thing to cover a lot of, a lot of miles and, and elevation on really well-established trails. Um, but on Ferguson, you're usually, you know, on trails, um, that I, I would put trails in, in quotes as mm. as a Westerner because it doesn't feel like a trail to me. Like I'm <laughs> consistently losing the trail because I'm I'm, you know, I'm just not uh not as observant as as the local people who are doing a really good job of of tracking exactly where everything you know both humans and animals has been walking in the forest. And so it's no problem for them to follow these these like hunter tracks that we're following. Um, but for me, it's like well, there's no trail. The there's West no trail there. It's, uh, <laughs> fighting through, yeah. Um, <laughs> So that's that's part of what makes it difficult. But then also, yes, it's really um, hot and humid, and there's constant river crossings. And those river crossings, you know, there's no bridges or anything. So you're you're either hopping across really slippery rocks, and then you know, risking whatever gear that you're carrying, um, and risking yourself a little bit, uh, or or you're wading kind of deep into the river, which is what I tended to do just to make sure I'm I'm maintaining my footing. And so it's just really slow going and pretty exhausting. And then you're getting eaten alive by a bunch of different insects, especially toward the end, like that last area that we went to where we ended up, you know, getting the camera trap image of the bird. Um, we, I counted 11 river crossings in just the span of, you know, probably a handful of kilometers. Yeah. Um, just, you just constantly cross this, this one uh, kind of main river. Um, so river crossings and then there's, tons of leeches there and mosquitoes and biting flies. And, um, I think there's, there's something that was burrowing into my, my ankles and legs by the time <laughs> I took a photo at the end of the trip, just to document just how awful my legs looked because they were just, <laughs> just eaten up and just welted. And, you know, my ankles and feet were, were swollen because I couldn't, couldn't wear my, it didn't make sense to wear my, my boots when you're doing all these river crossings. So we're doing a lot of the, these miles in, in, in sandals. Ugh. So it just took, it just took a toll. You know, yeah. I think we all fine with it for the, for the first few villages, but by the time we were at the end of the month and, you know, getting to this especially rugged area where we had tons of river crossings and more leeches and more insects, um, it all just, it was, you know, like the final boss that we had to, <laughs> we had to beat. And at that point you're already kind of carrying a lot of, a lot of bruises and, and bite marks and into that one. Um, but you know, it's, it's all, uh, yeah, it was, it was all worth it in, in, in the end. And, you know, as difficult as things were, I don't think any of us were ever, we're, we're never ready to, ready to give up. Um, mor- morale got, got pretty low at times, but yeah. we all, we all were still motivated to, to keep, keep the search going, you know, in, in the rare, in the, the unlikely event that somehow we were going to, we're going to come across this bird like, like we did. I mean, it did see, it's felt absolutely impossible for, for, you know, so much of the trip. Um, so before, before going into this trip, cause I know there has been like 
well, there's been sort of, someone said that it, it felt like we were looking for a unicorn sort of thing. Like, is yeah. is, that, is that genuinely yeah. how you felt? Because I know, obviously, you said like before yeah. there was like uh, certain hints that maybe this thing was here, but like, what was that yeah. like for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, so so one one important bit of context is you know I mentioned that in 2019 we worked with some hunters who seem to be familiar with the bird, but that was when we specifically pointed to the to this species. And again, I think that's it's where you can kind of maybe get get responses that are that are, you can trust a little bit less. Yeah, favorable. And ones, yeah. So so when we came back in 2022 with this more rigorous method of kind of assessing um, hunter knowledge. Um, those same those same hunters did not pick out the card for the for the pheasant pigeon really and so we had we had this lead that that was really our main hope and immediately that this is the first village we came to because that's the village that we knew and we already had the contacts to get up to the mountains and into the forest there like we're going to work with these people who claim to have seen this bird before and um actually one of them did pick out the pheasant pigeon um and did call it awo interestingly enough huh. in retrospect that was our first time hearing awo but when we asked him a bunch of follow-up questions, then he started to say, well, like, no, it looks different in these um, in these plumage patches. I think he said it was an all brown bird and described some things that didn't quite match the pheasant pigeon. Mm. Like, well, shoot, now, yeah. now this is our main lead and, and it's out. So we're kind of starting from scratch after that, that first village. Um, so, yeah, I mean, after, after a couple of weeks, we had been to several villages and had found no one who is familiar with the bird. And so, so at that point, yeah, what, what was that like? like? Oh, it, it was, yeah, it's pretty, pretty brutal. I think <laughs> that's where the morale, I mean, we had a, so we had a time that the, um, some of our team, some of our team left, um, with the donor. And so we kind of like pared, pared down that initial team of nine. And we had a brief time that it was just four of us is me and Jason, Doka and Ellie. So Jason and Doka were kind of the like camera trap leaders and uh you know they they know they know the birds both of them know the birds on ferguson super well um so they were kind of focusing on that and ellie and i were focusing on these hunter interviews so at the, at and, the time that these people left the donor especially were you thinking oh christ this is like a wild goose chase like what, did you have yeah. any sort of idea that you were going to find this no i i said i said i said at that point that it felt like we had a I, I gave it a ten percent chance that we would, that we would find it, which I think I remember thinking, well, that's actually a little bit optimistic. If, was I was going to say, like, if was that based on anything, or was that just blind hope? It, yeah, I think it was based on. Well, you know what it was based on is that, um, that there was so it, Ferguson has has had some logging, so there's been some habitat um, degradation for sure. But there's so much pristine habitat in the interior of that island, and we hadn't yet gotten into the interior. And so, you know, that 10% was, you know, if we're able to make it to some of these really remote villages um, where people are hunting in these, these areas that just really are, you know, totally pristine, that's where, where it feels like we still maybe have an outside chance that the bird could be around. But we, uh, you know, it's, we even were talking about whether or not this species ever existed. Like, what if they just, <laughs> well, because there's no location, there's no specific location yeah information for the two specimens all all that was described was that it was an extremely rugged ridge above 2000 feet on ferguson island and so i i think i think all of us figured that, that that was legitimate but when morale was lowest there was at one point a conversation or two of what if what if this was just um the collector attributed this to the wrong area and you actually got these on the mainland it's just one of the mainland species maybe there never was a pheasant pigeon on ferguson island um you know maybe someone brought over a couple of pheasant pigeons from the mainland <laughs> and there was never a stable population and it was never yeah like a viable species on this island you know there were so much so many so many doubts about it and then as to whether or not it still existed um so a little bit of doubt as to whether or not it ever existed on Fergus island significant doubt as to whether or not it still existed and then and then of course even more substantial doubt when you compound all these things to okay could it still exist and have us find it when we know that this you know it's going to be a, a an elusive and clearly rare species where there aren't many left and so yeah i mean it felt it felt impossible so we, and when we pared down to that small team the the last little bit of sort of morale morale gut punch here 
is that on top of just feeling really dire about our chances of finding this bird, we had, there's so much to keep track of on this trip. And we had a village that we were basing out of that we had worked in before that we had left all of our food stores and we had come back to that village and do a resupply. And so we'd have to anticipate what we would need for these trips. And now our team was shifting. And so we had to pack food for the main team for several days of having nine people in the core team and then having a separate food stash for the days that four of us were just going to do everything on foot and try to get into these remote villages in the interior, cover a lot of ground. So we want to travel light and bring as, you know, basically as little food as we can get away with, you know, not starve ourselves, but <laughs> not carry too much weight. And so we packed this separate food bag for just the four of us and we left that food bag. And we realized that we realized that when morale was already, you know, so low that like, clearly we're not going to find this animal. It might, might not even be around. Um, and then realized, well, well, shit, we, we don't have the food. We, <laughs> we need to do this trip. Um, we ended up, we ended up making do. We, we found it like a small canteen, um, where someone was selling, selling some, some goods. We were able to, able to get some things and, and kind of piece, piece together food. And, uh, yeah, but that, that's where our, our fortunes kind of started to shift when we, on, on that, uh, on the villages that we went to with that, with that small, small team, we were traveling really light and we were covering a lot more ground and we were getting to these really remote villages. And that's where we are finally getting people who are saying, yeah, I'm familiar with this bird. And all of them across a few different villages were pointing to the same area on the map that was really remote and rugged, but all of them were saying eighties or nineties. We used to see this bird when we would go in there for hunting or we would, or we'd walk this historic track that connects to this other village, or we would go take goods to, to sell in the market that was in this other village. And so, yeah, but interestingly, they were all pointing to the same area. So at that point, then we were at least feeling good that, okay, at least back in the eighties or nineties, it seems like this species, this species was there. Um, could it could it still be there? We don't know because none of these people are going to this really remote area now. Yeah. Um, so, so, like, how how long have you got left at this point of your trip? Yeah. So at the time that that like half the team went back and some of them came back, like John John um, John came back and Serena came back, um, who had kind of escorted people people back to the mainland. When you started to get these hits of like they were pointing yeah. to this certain point on the map, yeah, yeah, like how long yeah. how long left have you got? Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so at that point, we had about two, two and a half weeks left. Right. Okay. So you, you've still got a, a decent amount of time to at least have a go. It's not. Well, it's not amazing, but it's um, it's it's something. Well, when we when we first started hearing, when we first started finding people who were familiar with the species and pointing this area, we had two or two and a half weeks. Yeah. By the time that we that we left those areas, so it took you know multiple people doing that. For us to actually start kind of trusting the information, I will say hunt, the hunter, the the quality of the hunter knowledge using this more rigorous approach for assessing it was like tend to be really good. You know, we did there were some people, especially some some younger younger hunters who are less experienced, who their the accuracy that their knowledge wasn't wasn't quite as good. But generally, it's it is so impressive how well people there know know their birds, including really small songbirds that no one. You know, you wouldn't think anyone would be hunting for, and nobody has binoculars, and somehow they're they're identifying these species. So, yeah. anyway, um, that's part of why we felt so bad about our prospects of finding the bird for a while is that we were meeting with people who spent a lot of time in the forest and knew the birds really well, who had nothing knew nothing about this this pheasant pigeon. So, anyway, by the time that we we started to that we realized that we had multiple people pointing to the same area from the eighties or nineties. Um, where we really got it in our heads that we need, we need to go visit this area ourselves. We had about a week left oh, by the time we left those villages. That's, and, that's and so nothing though. That's nothing. And, and so what we decided to do is go to this village that people were telling us about where they would, it's hard to describe this out pointing to a map, but basically all these villages that I'm talking about, they're on one side of these, the biggest mountains on Ferguson. Yeah. And there's this historic track that would kind of, cut in this river canyon below those those tall mountains out to this village on the coast that's on the other side of the mountains and it was that village that we decided to we kind of put all of our eggs in that basket of we're going to take a boat around to that village it's going to be the last one that we visit interview people there and maybe we'll find people there who have 
more recent knowledge of the bird because that village is a little bit closer to this area that we had circled on the map. And, and then we can go out with those people, go into the forest with them because it's going to be easier access to get to this area from that side. And so that's what we did with our last week. Again, we had to do a quick, we, we did a quick stop for a resupply, like a 20 minute stop to quickly grab some food. We did not grab enough food. <laughs> so that was another, that was another thing. So by the time we get to this last village, we do find people who actually have recent, recent stories of the bird. And we, the, the bird seems to be just generally known uh, across almost everyone who we, who we chat with. Um, elders in the community are telling us that they used to use the bird for spells to uh, try to charm, you know, a woman in the village who, they're, who they're, they want to marry. Um, and they have a legend about the the bird being uh, a, a woman who is ostracized from her community and basically just end up living in the in the mountains by herself. And people would hear her kind of crying, which is the bird's song, I guess, yeah. um, hear her crying. They go in the mountains. So it became clear that this the owl, the pheasant pigeon was well known and perhaps you know a culturally important bird you know it's mm. i guess common enough and interesting enough to to people there that they had these legends and spells that revolved around it and so fortunately with this being the last place we were planning to visit we 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 went we went to the right to the right place um these are the exact people who we needed to to interact with and take us into this area to to go look look for the species but that's really um, mad like because on the other side of the mountain, they were like, "Yeah, I haven't seen it in a while." But the but on that side, you were saying it was recent stories. Recent stories. So we found we found two people who within the last year had seen one. Yeah. And the the one Augustine who is mentioned in some of the articles, mm -hmm. um, who ended up taking us into this remote area. He he is part of the group that that owns that land, and so he is seems like really the only one who's routinely going to this really remote, rugged area um for hunting and so he had claimed to have seen one a week before we arrived right okay and, yeah. and when when we heard that so ellie and i you know doing these interviews we heard that and like <laughs> oh, finally that's what we were waiting for but but at this i'm try, trying to give give you all the details here without it getting too convoluted because there's a lot there's a lot of drama drama on this trip. Bro, give me the drama um, it's, it's good i like it because we so before before we met with that guy so he he lived in one of the last houses before it was this before it was all just the the bush that we had circled on the map so he's like living kind of off the grid outside of the main village he's kind of in this separate like satellite village so in the main village that has quite a lot of people a lot more infrastructure um where we are still getting good stories about the bird we found one person who had claimed to have seen one once seven months ago and so most of the team went up with him and and looked in that area where he had um seen one seven months ago while ellie and i as the the interview team hiked along this river that i was telling you about that we had to cross so many times um to go try to meet with the the people in this kind of satellite village called duda ununa um that is the last last village before it's it's all just this forest and it was there that we met augustine and got this incredible information of yeah, I saw it a week ago, and he seemed to know the bird really well. Wow. And th but now because we're we're in an area where there's no cell phone service, um, now we have this. You know, we only have about five days left at this point, and most of our team is up on this mountain chasing chasing that the owl um, that was seen seven months ago. <laughs> and so Ellie and I had to then hike back down this river. You know, cross it eleven times. <clears throat> get back to the village, spend a night in the village, go up early the next morning, hike way up this mountain to go fetch the rest of our team. And, you know, there's a chance that we were going to go up there and they were going to say, oh, we actually, we actually found, found the bird up here. Yeah. Um, but instead what, what we found when, the, when we got up there was some demoralized team members. So like Jason and John and Doka and um, a bunch of local people um, who were guides and porters had been coming through the forest there and they were all just, didn't have to even ask them if they had had any success. You could just see it on their faces yeah. that they had covered some really difficult terrain and completely struck out and learned that, you know, this hunter, um, Paul, who had uh, seen the birds seven months ago, that was the one time that he had seen this, this species. Hmm. And he spent a lot of time in these areas. And so 
when we told them that we had these more recent reports from someone who had claimed to have seen this bird a lot, um, that the morale improved a bit, but then we had to, you know, hike down this mountain, um, <laughs> gather things in this village. I think we ended up sp spending the night and then, you know, move our way up, up this river, um, with all of the, the, the rest of our, of our food. Um, and so by the time we actually made it to this area that we had circled on the map, where we finally had recent reports of, of the owl, we had, I think it was four days left. That's nothing. So that, and like for those, for those days, obviously you're, are you out looking and you've got camera traps set? We dropped four, so we had some roaming cameras with us. We just only had to bring in four along because we didn't have that much time at that point. Um, and it takes a little bit of time to set them up. So we dropped four cameras. That was it. Four cameras for what? what, what trail term? cameras. What's that? The camera traps. Yeah, just four. Four? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Brother, Yeah. what? That's, That's it. I... Yeah, and, and each of those cameras had less had 48 hours or less of being set up and having a chance to detect the owl. Oh my God. It like, and, that's mad. So like, yeah, carry on, carry on. Like that's, so yeah. like, you, you've got, you've got to this point, you're setting things up. You've got five days, four days, five days, four, whatever. Carry on. Yeah. Four days by the time, by the time, I think by the time we actually got to the, the area where we're going to be searching, we had, Four days or less at that point. It may have been slightly less than four. Well, we thought it was going to be four days. It ended up being three days, um, which which I'll get to. So, the 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 first day we were, I took some some video as we were as we were hiking, and the morale was the highest it had been since the beginning of the trip, basically. And we were, I was kind of asking everyone what their percentage of finding the bird was, and we were all, all actually pretty high on our chances because we're teaming up with this guy who'd seen it a week ago. Um, I, I remember saying on the video that, you know, I wasn't optimistic that we were going to see or photograph the bird. Um, I was optimistic that we were going to hear it. And, you know, I had a professional um, recording device along, like, I'm going to be ready to, to, to record it. That's going to be our, our documentation of the species mm. um, because we're going to hike these, you know, really rugged ridges and any, any bird that's, you know, singing below these ridges, the sound is going to funnel up to the ridge on either yeah. side. Yeah. And so, Felt, felt really good about it. Um, but then after it only took, it only took really less than, less than four, less than 24 hours. So after an afternoon and a morning of looking around and covering a lot of ground, we were already like, man, this is not looking good. Um, cause none of us heard this bird vocalizing. We're using playback. So we're using a recording of, of the mainland species, which should sound really similar. So we're using that to try to, you know, elicit a response from, from any birds there in the area. So we're hiking ridges and blasting out this song as loud as we can, no response. And after doing that so many times, it becomes, it, it really with, with, cause with each, with each time you do that, you, you still have this hope that some, the, the, they're going to, there's going to be an owl that's singing in response to this, yeah. that's, that's territorial. It's going to hear this and sing back. And after doing that, you know, dozens of times at some point, it's like, man, we're just playing this song for a bird that might not exist. You know, like, yeah, I, I've, we, we, we still, I think all of us felt pretty good about it again, because the hunter knowledge is really good. Um, but there was still a little bit of doubt as to whether or not, well, like maybe, maybe it's being confused with another species. Mm -hmm. Um, there could be something we're missing. Cause that's, you know, it's happened before. Um, and yeah, so after after a day it felt like we didn't really have if if it felt pretty close to impossible again um <laughs> because if they're not vocalizing then we have so little chance and maybe we can flush one up we have a lot of people um because as it turns out you know about <laughs> half of the village came along with us which tends to happen you know because there hadn't been any westerners who had been to these areas before and so we tried to you know we're going to hi hire this many guys we're going to hire this many porters uh, we want the porters to go back after they after we pay them for carrying this gear because we only have food for this amount of people. But we ended up <laughs> building the camp along this river where it seemed like more and more people just kept coming to the river <laughs> who had who had followed us there because we're such a um, 
we're such a novelty there. Yeah. Um, and so I think people just wanted to see what we were up to. And, you know, it's their lands that have every right to hmm. come around and camp with us. But then, of course, we wanted to make sure everyone was fed. And so we went, we, this is where we realized that we just did not bring enough food. And so we were, we were, we were running out of food, which didn't help with our morale. Um, so just to give you an, an idea of what, what, what it looked like to run out of food, um, for, for breakfast, I was having one heaping spoonful of peanut butter and, and nothing else. And then would go out for, you know, eight hours looking, looking, um, covering some really difficult terrain, no trails, really steep ridges, hiking along, you know, rivers with giant boulders. And, um, so, so that was the fuel for the morning. And then, and then for, for, for lunch and dinner, it was rice with instant noodles on top and a little bit of tuna. And it got so bad. We were, we were running out of, uh, running out of tuna that we had, t- we had over 20 people who were in camp with us, who we were, we were trying to feed. And there was one little can of tuna, you know, not yeah. one of the big, cans, like one of the, one of the thin cans that was split, you know, 20 something ways. <laughs> Mad. That's crazy. Uh, and that was the protein that everyone had to, to work off of. So it was, uh, <laughs> that, that wasn't great, but again, you know, in the moment, it's, it seems ridiculous now, but in the moment we knew that we only had so many days left. Yeah. Um, you'll get through it. And we just, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna get up and, and look around regardless. <clears throat> and, there's still that sliver of hope that somehow we could get lucky and, and come across the bird. And the the last bit of drama was on what was supposed to be on, on our second day there, which is supposed to be our third to last day, I think, or second to last day, supposed to be our third to last day. Um, timeline was already getting a little bit hazy, but <laughs> um, we, our guide ended up uh, getting us lost. And so people in New Guinea are, are lauded for their ability to, uh, you know, find their way through the forest and pick up on landmarks that, you know, us with Western eyes would, uh, would, would never yeah. pick, pick up on. Um, and I've never experienced it before with, with local people getting lost anywhere, but this, this area is just, there's so many steep ridges that are kind of folded on top of each other with these narrow river canyons in them. And he ended up taking us to the wrong river. And so we, you know, again, with having just a spoonful of peanut butter, <laughs> uh, got lost for several, several hours, ended up in the oh, wrong river. And didn't realize it for a while we lost our guide because i think he kind of panicked that he um that he had led us to the wrong place so he hiked ahead to try to find the camp himself which fortunately he did and came back and found us but there were several hours where we were lost we didn't have our guide with us oh my god and, uh, at that point you know i was taking a lot of gopro videos during during this point too just kind of <laughs> I was trying to document every all the twists and turns of this trip like this is a new we've had some lows and this is this is the biggest low yeah clearly there's no scenario now where we find this bird we're lost we're all tired we're like beaten up um there's just constantly pulling leeches off of off of my ankles and feet um and yeah it at that point there's there's no scenario where we're going to find the bird and that but we we're at least supposed to have still a little bit of time left to kind of recover from this really brutal day so by the time we made it back to the camp it, it had been you know about nine hours i think of of hiking around and um like four or five of those hours we were we were lost and you know kind of frantically covering ground trying to figure out where we needed to go to get to camp and we made it to camp and uh like all right at least now we can kind of rest and recover and if we still have a little bit of time left it feels like we have no chance but we're gonna we're gonna keep going um and then our guide um told us that he was um told us through through our translator um that he was concerned about like the local spirits who kind of um occupy these these remote areas um so there's a lot of traditional beliefs about uh bringing people to remote areas like this who are who are outsiders um even if you're an outsider from within new guinea but especially if you are you know a a white um Mm. outsider like us um, I've run in, run into this a little bit before, um, hike, hiking around in, in remote places in New Guinea. Um, so it wasn't, wasn't surprising to me that, that this had become a concern and, um, said that he's being visited by, by fireflies and that's taken as like, you know, they're carrying this message of, Hey, you brought these people here and, um, you know, maybe we're uncomfortable with these people being here. Um, I think. You know, some of our, our local partners who have encountered this before and have been doing research with us um, thought that it was more about 
this is the same guy who had gotten us lost and had, I think, injured himself a little bit. So he's a little oh, bit okay. hobbled. Uh, yeah. And so there's some impression from from some of our local partners that sometimes it's this is a way to kind of justify sh shifting a plan when maybe there's not a desire to keep doing this work. Because again, yeah. and which is totally understandable, we we're on this wild goose chase. It feels like we're not going to find the bird. I'm sure to him too. Yeah. And we don't have as much food as we should have. And, you know, morale is low for, for everyone. And as you know, the local people there are so much tougher than we are for sure. It's not even, not even close. Um, everyone we teamed up with, you know, we're really careful about making these arrangements, making sure everyone is happy with, you know, exactly what we are, um, offering, um, to get to these, these areas of like, this is, these are the guys we're hiring. These are the porters we're hiring. This is what we're paying the guys, the porters, you know, this is the number of days, you know, make sure everyone is, is on board. And, and everyone's really excited to take us into this forest because at that point they knew that like, this is the end of our trip. We've gone to a lot of places mm -hmm. and their village is the one where finally we got really motivated to go look for this bird. And so there's, I think a lot of pride wrapped up in it yeah. too, of we're going to be the ones who deliver this um, thing for, for these uh, folks who have come, you know, travel from, across the globe to try to find this bird we're gonna be the ones who help him do it so there was a lot of enthusiasm for it which is how we end up with another reason why we ended up with with so many people mm. camping with us so this this is supposed to be yeah so we were supposed to have some days left so i, I kind of confused the timeline a little bit so when this when this happened it was the day after we got lost yeah when he told us we had to go yeah, yeah, yeah. and so at that point we were supposed to have one day left but instead we decided shoot we just had to pack up and go now because we need to be respectful of this and so now we've lost one of our days and the last thing we need to do because he told us this in the afternoon um last thing we have to do is just go fetch the trail cameras um and so doka and i decided that that we'd go get get the two trail cameras that we left up on on a ridge above camp hmm. um while the others started to, to pack up camp and then by the time we got down, we were just going to quickly you know, shovel whatever food we had left in and hike, you know, the, the four or so hours the, uh, down to down to this village um, before it got dark. And that's where, you know, we came to the first camera. I just grabbed that one. I didn't even know at this point because I was not taking the lead on the camera trap stuff. Jason, Jason and Doka were. Hmm. Um, I... I didn't know. I actually, it sounds like from chatting with Jason and Doka after the fact, they didn't know either that you could even preview the images on on some of the trail cameras that we had brought. So there are yeah. two different brands. One of them you could you could preview the images. So the first one I didn't even know that was the case. I just grabbed it, put it in my backpack. Doka was with me, and we just kept moving. The second one, I, I think, was just tired because it had been a long, a <laughs> long trip. And you know, the day before is when we were lost and covered so many kilometers and difficult kilometers. And so, and we're at now at, at another ridge top. And so I just kind of plopped down while I was taking the camera and I realized that Doka wasn't, wasn't next to me. I didn't know what he was doing, but he wasn't right there. And so I was just like, I'm just going to pay, I'm just going to like see if I can see any images on here. And I started scrolling through and like, as per usual with camera traps, you know, it starts with a bunch of images of, of us setting them up. Like, yeah, cool. There's a bunch of cam photos on here, but it's all just going to be us setting up the camera. And sure enough, that's what it was. And I was getting close to the end of the, the reel. And then suddenly, suddenly saw this, what, you know, what really did feel like a, a mythical creature. I know John described it as like, like finding a unicorn. Um, and it really did to me in that moment, it felt like it, it was, it was so surreal, more surreal than anything I've ever experienced because it, it really, at that point, it it just was inconceivable that I could be seeing a photo of this bird. There's never been a photo of the bird. So I didn't have a reference point. I knew what an illustration looked like of the bird, but never seen the bird myself. I'd only seen an illustration, never seen a photo. Like, holy shit. It was immediately clear that this, it was the bird that we were after. It was out. There's nothing else that looked like that. It's a tiny LCD screen that I'm looking at. Um, but there's just nothing else it could be. But I was still trying to trying to go through the checklist of like, what could I be missing that could explain this? That isn't us getting a, a photo of the pheasant pigeon. Cause surely we couldn't have gotten a photo of the pheasant pigeon. Um, and I just instinctively, I had the GoPro in my pocket and just instinctively pulled it out and just started recording as I was holding the camera trap, just shaking. 
what is happening right now. You know, I, there's no thought given to any of this stuff. I called Doka over and uh, like, again, absolutely no thought given to any of this. Um, just handed him the camera and like, I knew that I figured that he didn't know that, that you could scroll through the photos to so just, you know, explain like, just, just click, click one over um, button to the right. And yeah, we, you know, his, his response obviously um, was just absolutely perfect. You know, if I recorded myself responding to it, would it have just been me just kind of blankly staring at the screen? <laughs> Every, all the processing was, was happening internally. And, um, but for him, yeah, I mean, he, he could see all the, the phases that he went through of, you know, it started with just disbelief where you like had to sit down um, because I, like you just couldn't process what was happening. And then, you know, jumped up and is fist bumping and punching the ground. And um, one thing I'll say about Doka is, you know, he is, he, he and I are, are really close. He's named, uh, he named his last kid after me. Um, oh man what uh what an honor that is the biggest the biggest honor i've ever received because we've you know we've traveled oh. all over the country together um both doing research but then he's traveled with me as as a as a tourist and um so there's you know there's a, a deep connection there oh. and he has such a colorful personality and, and i really wanted to capture that during the trip and oh. i couldn't because he's really camera shy and <laughs> i Every time he heard the GoPro gone, eventually I realized that I could I could turn the sound off, which helped. <laughs> but he always he would because he's so observant. He's more observant than anyone I've ever known, and probably will ever know, which is what makes him so one of the things that makes him so good at what he does. But also, he's just tireless. Um, and so he would always clock that I had the the camera running, and then he would hide, um, and usually also like scold me a little bit for trying to record him <laughs> uh, because. Yeah, but but I think you know he you know we talked about it. He was he was fine with me with me taking footage. It just you know it, it made him uncomfortable in the moment, and so his instinct was to was to to run from it. He's you know I've taken photos with him, but he's never asked to take a photo. Mm. Um, he tends to tends to run from that too. Um, but you know he in that moment he he didn't care at all. And actually, as I was was recording, um, he even asked me to. T- take a photo of him. So I have this photo of him, his arms outstretched, you know, where we had detected the bird. He has this, you know, big smile, you know, <laughs> people see the video. Um, he's never done that before. He's never wanted me to take, take a, a photo of him somewhere. Um, and yeah, I mean it, cause everything, everything just kind of went, went blank, I think for both of us. And it's just this processing, this unbelievable, unbelievable moment mm. um and i and i think to, to provide, provide a little bit more context too with, with doka's response um he put so much pressure on himself to deliver um to deliver these kind of results for us and yeah. so like i mentioned before you know he's made some really difficult experiments that i've led possible because he is so unusually good with doing um, bird work in the field and so everything that we've ever set out to do, including some really ambitious stuff, we've, we've always been able to accomplish. And he's always put that, I think, that pressure on himself to help deliver that. And so I think part of why he had such an extreme response to it is he had put so much pressure on himself. And he was the one who was consistently saying, like, no, we're still going to find it. We're still going to find it. Like he's putting it like 80 to 100 percent for a lot of the trip <laughs> while the rest of us were dropping it way down low. And so I think for him, there's a lot of just relief of. Yeah okay like i haven't i still haven't failed <laughs> you know he's just he's never failed at anything he's wanted to do um but so i, I think he yeah, went, from, yeah. went from i think thinking that for the first time in his in his life that he was gonna you know f- fail at something that he really wanted to do mm. to like yes i did it um and uh, I, I suppose we, now you, you captured that moment that will like for him as well just never be forgotten it's there it's like and the whole world yeah. has seen it and it's such a beautiful uh bit of footage that as you're saying it was just instinctive turn it on and let this happen and it was just captured beautifully it was just it like it meant, whether you meant it or not it was just it was amazing and like seeing that from my point of view and i suppose a lot of people around the world who would i mean dream of doing something like that it's um just to see that satisfaction and that relief is just, just yeah amazing it's wicked yeah, it's, I mean, it's a one. It truly is a once in a lifetime experience for for both of us. I mean, it, I'll never be in a position like that again where I'm seeing 
the first ever photo for a bird species. It's just not, it's not going to happen. There's aren't opportunities <laughs> for that to happen. Yeah. I mean, um, so like w w when you were flicking through what is, and you got to it, what, what was going through your head at that moment? Honestly, I have I have no idea because ev everything everything went blank. I, there there was this excitement, there was disbelief, which fortunately I was able to kind of talk through a little bit. I talked it through with Doka, like it can't can't be anything else because after his after his response to that, he he started doubting it too. I was like, <laughs> well, okay, what what else could it be? It can't it can't be the owl, right? And we talked through it, and like, no, there's. There's nothing else. And it, it looked so perfect. I mean, there's just nothing else that would have that that silhouette. You know, we could get some a little bit of a sense of the 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 plumage color and, and it all matched, but really it was just the shape of the bird and it's walking on the ground. Like there's there's just nothing else. But still, because it's it felt impossible that we would have have photos of the bird, we still like kind of try to talk ourselves out a little yeah. bit. Um but yeah, I think I think it was really just it was just sh just shocking. And it just caused everything to go blank in a way that I haven't I haven't really experienced before. Certainly not in the context of research. I've never had a finding where it just suddenly just changes. Uh, suddenly like my perception of everything just just shifts in that moment, you know? Um so we, we were already making plans with Doka and Ellie, who is who is leading the, the interviews, making plans for like, okay, we should be able to get some small pot of funds to kind of funnel to you guys to go do more interviews. And maybe leave some camera traps because they Ellie can lead the interviews by himself by the end of this trip. Um, he doesn't need me there to ask questions. Um, Doka doesn't need Jason's help with setting up trail cameras. He knows how to set up all the trail cameras. And so we were thinking, like, how how could we get both of these guys back to this area where we feel like the bird is still there, based on these local reports, to detect it um while we're back in the u.s because it takes too much funding for us to get back yeah. and no one wants to fund it's hard to find funders for something so speculative like this where you're mo most likely to to fail in, in your mission um so at least we were we were feeling good about that but we were you know really kind of coming to these coming to terms with the fact that we hadn't found it and what what can we do to just have a chance of, of detecting it um in the future and so yeah it's just no, none of it none of it felt real i mean it took it took hours for it to to feel real we actually after this hiked down you know i say in the video um we can't tell anyone like the first one of the first things i thought about is because i've done just a little bit of camera trapping before and we we ended up with detecting some wolverines in this area that you know wolverines had just been confirmed to be back in this park for the first time in a long time and we had these incredible images of them and i wasn't there when I was usually the one in the car that was scrolling through the the camera trap images. It was the one trip that I wasn't there to page through, and you you know we had these Wolverine images, and you know it was a moment that I was I wanted to be a part of, um, and so I I immediately thought in this moment of okay, we're having this incredible experience of seeing these images for the first time and the shock that that brings. We can't give this away. We have to like bring it down, especially to to Jason and. And John and Serena, who are you know part of the core team who have been with us on this journey, um, let them have like a similar experience of not expecting to see an image of this bird and then suddenly being confronted with the image. And so that's you know in the in the short clip that I posted, um, you know I say to Doko, we can't we can't tell <laughs> we can't tell them. It was one of the first things I thought about. Um, uh we can't tell them we have to you know hike down and be be quiet and so we talked a lot on our on our hike back down to camp about how we were gonna like we kind of force ourselves to calm down a little bit like we have to get our our poker faces ready so we just hand over the camera trap and just um have have them experience the same thing um and their their response you know of course i'll, I'll post that at, at some point too um, oh do you video that as well video that as well oh uh, man yeah <laughs> yeah but but of course i mean Do doka's response is uh yeah i mean Do doka's response is is absolutely absolutely perfect you know it encapsulates every all the excitement of of that um you can you can still see i think their response is is, is pretty good too um yeah. it's a little bit it's a little bit more subdued um you can see john immediately just grab he just gets up instinctively and goes to grab his camera i think the same way that i just instinctively grab the gopro out of my pocket like there's no no thought that went into that 
that moment. But I think because he didn't know that we knew that there were images on there, he wanted to make sure that someone was documenting like, holy shit, like we did, we did this thing yeah. that we didn't think we were going to do. Um, so then all of us are now in the same kind of place of just disbelief and everything being surreal. And we were in such a state of shock that we, you know, packed up camp and started hiking and we left one of the trail cameras by, by camp. And so initially Jason and I doubled back because Doka was going to grab some other cameras um because he's a an absolute beast and went to get this camera that we had left in this extremely difficult spot that we all dreaded fetching and of course doko was the one who was you know had the energy to go get it but then jason and i started hiking down and we realized and we were like halfway down it's so like four hour hike Ugh. going down the super steep ridge we were two hours down like oh no we left we left this trail camera and so jason and i started hiking up and then we met doka on the way and then Doka and I continued all the way up and that's, well, that's where, you know, we were just buzzing. We, we were buzzing with this, just this disbelief that we, we just weren't thinking at all about what we were doing. We yeah. just threw on our packs and just started hiking without, <laughs> so, without considering the ramifications of if we left something up there, how, <laughs> how difficult it was going to be to go back. So Doka and I ended up having, um, you know, some of the excitement got washed away temporarily because it was <laughs> brutal to get back up there, especially with the state that we were in. Yeah. And um, and we kind of lost it for a little bit too. Like we had a hard time finding finding the camera that we left, and it was it was it was a, a long day. And by the time Joke and I made it back to to the village, then it was it was dusk, and then you know it's a, it's a long long sweaty hike. So you want you want to shower, and how do you shower? You have to jump in the river, and well, the river is also a little bit of a hike. You know, you have to hike down <laughs> the river back up to the river and you have to fill up water to drink and to cook with. And, you know, it's just, things are just never easy there. Yeah. Um, and so that's where it's kind of started to maybe not sink in fully, but where some of that just initial, um, excitement and disbelief because we we're so exhausted, it just kind of got replaced with like, okay, no, we just need to get back with like <laughs> these images intact. Um, the, the job's not done yet. We still have miles to cover. We still have a long boat ride. We still have some security concerns with just getting all of our gear back. Yeah. Um, so let's let's not let's not get like too too excited until until we get back. Um, so, like, uh, how many photos or videos were captured? Four four photos. Hmm. Um, should have been a burst of five. We don't actually know what happened. It took a burst of four. Um, <laughs> And then one video. So, yeah, yeah, to kind of so the the the, the surprising thing. How, how what's the easiest way to explain this? So that first village that we came to, where we had some leads mm -hmm. before, and one person picked out the pheasant pigeon, but then started describing something that sounded like another bird. We end up leaving cameras along an elevational transect there, um, just to get a sense of what other species were in the forest especially like what introduced species might be there that could be responsible for the decline of the pheasant pigeon. So one thing we we're thinking about is more likely than not, we don't find this bird. There's a chance that through doing these interviews, we, we realize that it's probably gone extinct, that, that there's some knowledge of that it used to exist, but everyone tells us it doesn't exist now. And the knowledge is really good. And so we trust that. And so how do we get some data that can help kind of complete the picture of what may have happened? And one thing that could have happened is that rats and cats came over to the island we know that certainly there's going to be rats and cats on the island cats are killing adults rats are raiding the nest because it should be a ground nest with just one egg mm. and that could have been um responsible for the decline of of the species and so that was one thing we were thinking about especially jason who was you know doing spending a lot more time with with the camera trapping stuff um how, how do we kind of help complete the picture with you know, maybe let's let's document the the invasive species that are on on this island. So, left an elevational transect of, of twelve cameras. Um, not even thinking that we could have gotten a pheasant pigeon on one of those. It wasn't until days later that we were back in 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 town um, sh before flying out that we were rifling through those images and suddenly again at this moment, you know, it was a little bit yeah. a little bit more severe. But and that was video, shit. yeah. Here we go again. Well, so we saw the photos and then it wasn't until days after that that we realized that that, that was one of the cameras that takes video in addition. So all the cam all the photos are super up close because the bird passed right in front of the camera and all of them cut off 
the bird's head. <laughs> and so we were so close to getting the perfect trail cam photo. Yeah. But man, we just missed out. Cool that we got another detection, I guess. But shoot, these photos are kind of disappointing. And then it was days later, like right before we were going to fly out. Like, right. Those those cameras also take video, I think. Let's go see if we have video. I'm like, wow, we have a beautiful video of this bird. But it it, it, it almost like shows off like strutting in front of the... It does. Yeah, really <laughs> it's like the perfect yeah. image, isn't it? Proper side on, you get the full view, it struts around, yep. it's wicked. Yeah. And like, yeah. Well, so what, what's it like, yeah? What's it like knowing that part of the, the group that you're with has filmed and photographed this for the first time ever? Yeah. Yeah, it's... It, it that that part still doesn't feel totally totally real you know yeah. Th this is something i would have as a kid i was really i really wanted to discover things and i was really you know interested in animals and would go out and catch catch animals and take them into captivity briefly just to observe them like frogs and yeah. uh, lizards and whatever i could find and um yeah so this is the kind of thing that i envisioned i would be doing as a kid in an ideal scenario but then, yeah, at some point I kind of figured that this, there's, there not, aren't many opportunities to do this, this kind of work. And again, my, my training as, as a, as a scientist is not doing this kind of work. This isn't normally, normally, um, the kind of research that I'm, that I'm doing. Um, so I just, I just feel really, really lucky. Um, I feel really lucky. I feel lucky to have gotten the opportunity to start working in New Guinea where, there were opportunities to go do side projects like this that were a little bit outside of my my realm of ex expertise. I'm really lucky that I happened to hire Jason in 2019 as my as my field assistant. He's this incredible ecologist who, um, you know, he he chose to to join me to do this ferry run work because he knew I was going to be doing this exp this little expedition at the end, and he mm. this was his first opportunity to do an expedition. The one we did in 2019 and then he had some great ideas of of how to turn that into you know something productive when the initial thing that we were trying to do in that expedition failed you know he had some great ideas of how to pivot to make it make it successful and so i feel lucky to have hmm. connected with him and that this has now turned into a long-term collaboration and then feel really lucky that you know, this came across um that this lost species project was started and i didn't know much about it um but that john at ab's uh, american bird conservancy happened to come across our paper and decided that we were the ones who could help try to find this lost species and then you know of course then we just owe owe things owe this detection to to the the local people yeah. um yeah. to doka as as a as a you know papua new guinea national who's not from ferguson um but who is just so unbelievably skilled um ellie for hit the work he did translating for these interviews was really impressive there's papua new guinea is the most linguistically diverse country in the world there's over 800 languages in, in a small country yeah. and so on ferguson there's multiple multiple languages that he's able to just toggle between um and so we got really lucky that we just happened to happen to meet him in 2019 because he's really well known across ferguson island because he's part of this traditional shell trade there um and so that's part of also why he speaks all the languages in, in this area mm -hmm. so he was the perfect person for us to have leading these interviews even when we weren't doing the interviews he was out um he's a really social um vibrant personality you'll people who who uh, uh subscribe to the the wild birds of, of new guinea uh channel will see a lot more of ellie because he is not at all camera shy um, he has this really colorful personality and, um, it was always just connecting with as many people as possible in these villages and, mm. and asking, asking them, um, more questions about the bird, even when we weren't doing formal interviews. And so he was the one who knew about like these last houses that we came to before it was the bush where we found the people who, um, really helped deliver this, this in incredible, um, this incredible finding, um, and then, of course, just so so many local people who are who are guiding us in these parts, especially Augustine there at the end. Who, um, yeah, he we picked up on the that there was something walking along this ridge, um, a large terrestrial bird that wasn't to him. It wasn't this the scrub fowl, which is the common large terrestrial bird. Mm. I wouldn't have noticed that there were any tracks there at all. If I saw that there were tracks, there's no way I would have been able to distinguish between the scrub fowl and the pheasant mm. pigeon. Um, 
he was the one who said, no, there's an Awo is walking on this ridge. And then Doka was the one who picked that, that specific spot that delivered, that delivered the image. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of credit to be shared. It's really just Absolutely. a, it's a syner synergy between indigenous knowledge and modern technology. Yeah. That, that delivered this. We 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 had we had the technology and the expertise for for setting it up um and managing managing that stuff. But they're the ones who it's not a rediscovery to them. And mm. that's you know it's a little bit complicated with this with this news is the easiest way to for it to be kind of pitched, I think, um is as a rediscovery because it is a rediscovery to science, but that tends to be lost in in the the coverage of this is mm. The, the, only, the reason that we found this bird is that it was still around and local people knew it was still around. And to them, it was yeah. just another bird that was in their forest. And so to them, it's not a rediscovery. They, it's been there all along. Mm. Um, they just didn't know that it was a, a, a special bird mm. and didn't have the equipment to, to document it themselves. And so really the bulk, the bulk of the credit goes to them and they're the ones who are going to, um, be key to, to learning a lot more about the species and, and figuring out how we want to go about conserving it. You know, that's going to be up to them how, how we approach that. And so there are things that we can, things that we can help with, you know, mostly hopefully bringing some economic, sustainable economic benefits, these areas to replace the, the revenue that would be generated for, you know, selling to logging um, for instance. Um, oh yeah. Sorry. That's one last one thing that we haven't talked about. The I think the one remaining thing that I, that I want to mention to add drama to this story, before making the plan to go to this area where we end up finding the bird, you know, which is just days left, the last person we interviewed, who is the primary landowner for this area, told us he had just signed over that land to logging. No way. Company was going to arrive at any point. So that was that was a. Uh, there's so much drama with this trip that it's yeah. something always gets left out. Um, but that added a lot of pressure to all of us to try to find the bird because he again people there they don't they didn't know that this was a special bird that's only known from their island mm. and so after we do the interviews we'd often pull out this poster that we made that was focused on the, the pheasant pigeon and just kind of explain why we're coming all the way from the u.s to go try to find it and i could see when he was talking with ellie um because you know, they're speaking in local language so i couldn't understand what they were saying but i it did look that he like he was starting to get concerned or upset and then ellie told me like oh he he's concerned because he just signed over the land of logging and now we're telling him that this is the one area that everyone is pointing to that could be harboring the species is the land that he just signed over and he doesn't he doesn't know what he can do about that he wants to do something about it we didn't tell him what to do yeah um that, that's not our role um he was the one who immediately started getting concerned of like oh I don't. I don't want to be responsible for this. This bird disappearing. Yeah. So what? So what there, will happen with that? Is there anything that has come of that, or we're we not sure? Yes. There's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of nuance to this, and that's part of why I think, you know, we've spoken a little bit with journalists about the this logging threat, mm. um, but it's the the story is a little bit complicated because it's true that the land was just signed over to logging. The company's supposed to arrive at any minute, but then we heard from a pretty reliable source that. Logging companies there can't um, log at a certain degree of slope. And like I was saying, you know, this, the, these ridges are extremely steep and rugged. And so I, we all kind of figured that, well, this is beyond the slope that they can, that they're allowed to log on, hmm. um, at least the specific area where we end up finding the bird. Um, and it's just also hard to imagine how they'd even build logging roads into this area. Yeah. It's like, it's so brutal. Um, so, it's it's complicated. I'm I'm sure that there's it, I'm sure that th there is a logging company that's going to arrive at any minute because there's been a a series of logging companies that have extracted uh, timber from from that island, mm. um, and I'm sure that there will be some logging within the area that we had kind of circled on the map that people were pointing to. Um, but I think they're going to be pretty limited as to how much they can really pull out of there okay. because of the nature of the terrain. So it's hard to know exactly how much of a threat that is to the pheasant pigeon if they are occupying these really steep ridges they might 
they might be okay. It's complicated. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like until the logging company actually shows up and starts building roads. And um, I've reached out to, to people in the, in the government in, in, in Papua New Guinea um, who uh, work in these conservation offices and still awaiting awaiting their response. Um, so there are things we might be able to do to try to conserve that area. But the key is that we 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 just approach things the way local people want to approach them and we have to we have to be we have to bring some sort of economic uh incentive mm -hmm. or or some sort of infrastructure that we have to we have to provide something um we can't just go in there and say hey this bird is important you can't go in there even though it's your land and that's it we're not going to we're, <laughs> we're not going to offer you anything in return <laughs> Yeah. Um, because people there, they, uh, it, the cost of getting resources to, to these remote, remote areas on Fergus Island is so expensive. And so trying to get rice or clothes for your kids or uh, what you pay is absurd. And there's just no, there's no opportunity to really make money there. There's no formal jobs. You can mm -hmm. trade things in markets and sell some garden veggies and um, cash crops, but um, there just aren't enough economic opportunities. And so that's, that's something that, that hopefully we can, we can help, we can help develop to, so that everyone kind of gets what they want out of this arrangement where we can, we can make sure this, the pheasant pigeon sticks around and local people can continue using, using this land in a sustainable fashion. Cause we don't think that hunting at this point is really a major threat. No one we found who has had any experience hunting this bird has gotten anything but one individual over the course of their whole lifetime. So hunting doesn't seem to be a major threat. And so there's no no reason for us to try to ban people from going into their land yeah. um, hunting or um, really doing anything, frankly. Um, it's just a matter of uh, making sure logging doesn't, doesn't destroy the habitat and and we can offer something to to help offset you know the, the little bit of money that would be made by by getting a logging company in there so i mean it's an amazing thing and it's marred by that i suppose a little bit but there's ultimately there's not really a lot you can do um if we if we if we take ourselves away from that for a second um and focus on yourself because i suppose now with this sort of thing that's happened are you in demand? Like what's next for you? Yeah. I, so I have a variety of projects I'm, I'm working on, um, as a, as a postdoc at the, at the lab of ornithology. So th this is just, this is just one project of, of many. This is a definitely a high priority for me, especially because, you know, we want to act fast to learn more about the species and start developing conservation priorities based on what we learn. Yeah. Um, that's important. And so this has kind of gone to the top of the top of the list. Mm. Um, so as far as being in demand, I, I guess more how I think about it is, you know, how, how do I want to spend my time and resources? And so, yeah, th this, this currently is the, the major focal, fo focal point for, for Jason and I. And so he and I are working on grant pro 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 proposals and, um, trying to find, um, you know, donors who might want to fund some follow-up work so we can get back there soon. Mm. Um, ideally before this logging company is there, um, and just figure out how many are left in this area where we found, found the bird. Um, but also try to start getting a sense of other places on Ferguson Island that might be harboring this species. Yeah. And so that's where really we just need, um, to send Ellie ahead to some villages and do these interviews that he and I did together. Mm. And from there, we can kind of get a sense of where the species might exist. And then we can go bring cameras up there to confirm or, or deny that. Um, I guess more confirm than, than deny. It's hard, hard to um, prove that something is not around. Um, and then just get, start to get a handle of how many are, how many are left and where we should focus our, our, our resources for conserving it interesting so yeah i mean the whole thing is fascinating and i mean you've condensed a whole month's worth of an expedition into uh, sh like a short amount of time but it just the whole thing sounds amazing it's just it's like the stuff of dreams and it's uh it's lovely you've been able to capture it in the way you have and you've mentioned you've got yourself a youtube channel which you're going to be uploading videos to um do you, would you like to tell people what's going to be on there and what it is 
Yeah. So it's the wild birds of New Guinea channel. Uh, and so I was taking GoPro videos uh, every day of, of, of our trip, just documenting all the twists and turns of this expedition, um, all the adventures and, and misadventures. It was frankly more misadventures <laughs> <laughs> probably than adventures. Uh, but really what I wanted to highlight uh, is just how incredibly beautiful this island is. It, it's it's a really unique place and the people are um, also really unique and vibrant. And so I want to highlight, you know, our, our team members and some of the people we worked with in, in these, these villages that we came to and just what it looked like on the ground to try to find the species and, you know, how, how we went about uh, getting the, the first, the first photo in the end, um, against, against all odds. And so yeah. I really tried to document every, every component of, of this, you know, once in a lifetime journey to this, to this finding. Uh, so yeah, so I'll be posting those videos with, with some, some narration just to kind of explain exactly what was happening, uh, in the field. So there, there are a lot of videos where I, where I do kind of, kind of narrate as I'm, as I'm taking, taking the video, but a lot of river crossings where it was, you know, impossible for me to really capture good audio. And, um, you know, that's where I'll, just sort of narrate what what it looked like and where we were going and try to try to chart everything on the map so people can get a sense of you know how much ground we covered and what it looks like to cover that ground with with boots or more more usually sandals on the ground and um, through these these uh raging rivers and rugged ridges yeah it was uh it was memorable sounds wicked so everybody who's watching if you want to go and learn more about the wild birds of new guinea from jordan over here make sure you go and subscribe and you're going to see some really really insightful stuff over there so go over there and make sure you subscribe and when these videos come out big likes comments all of that sort of fun stuff anyway jordan thank you for telling the story i really appreciate it it's a madness uh historical things you've recorded the first ever how well how sick <laughs> that's wicked thanks cookie thanks thanks for uh chatting with me yeah, absolutely no worries, mate. Thank you for your time.